Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name's Lee, and I'm here to introduce uh, the rest of the previous Next guys um, who have done some brilliant work on the Nova FM website, um, which I believe is a responsive-based site. Um, I actually did the design for it, but I can't take any credit because <laughs> I did the easy bit, and these guys made it come to life. So we've got Jack Taranto, um, Nick, I'm sorry, I don't know your surname. I, mean, I can't... She? And, and Christian Biggins. So um, please take it away, Jack. Thanks very much, Lee. Cool. So as uh, Lee just mentioned, um, my name's Jack Taranto. I'm a front-end developer and themer. And I've been working with Previous Next for about three years. Might even be coming up in four years now. Um, I've worked on a huge variety of projects doing theming for heaps of different stuff, small sites and really big sites like Nova FM. Um, and Christian Biggins and Nick Shu will also be speaking. So, so um, we'll be covering uh, a largely technical um, overview of Nova's site. Um, it's, it says on the session that it's a beginner, but it's probably actually more like an intermediate. So um, hopefully that doesn't scare any people away. But we'll be showing you lots of different um, code examples and things like that focusing specifically on the responsive design um, and Christian will be taking you through the um, enormous data migration um, task and Nick will be focusing on hosting um, and GOIP. So um, Nova came to us and um, they wanted a complete, I've got a spelling mistake there, but that's all right. Um, they wanted a complete redesign of their entire website. So it was based on a um, totally custom CMS, which had um, evolved organically over quite a few years. And it had like tons of different stuff added into it. It didn't really have any, um, like the, the, the original structure was completely lost. Um, so yeah, they came to us, we had to redesign that. We had to migrate um, all of the data and um, we had to um, build it and make it responsive as well. So uh, it was a pretty immense task. Um, the total development time, I think, was maybe around three months. I'm not exactly sure. Um, there was about five of us working on it, I think, at the most, um, maybe six. So there were... Uh, hundreds, um, literally hundreds of thousands of nodes that we had to migrate. Um, there, were, there was an, an immense amount of advertising. The whole site's advertising based and every page has got um, ads all over it. Um, and it's mainly, thanks to, it's, um, it's a really media heavy site as well. So there's images everywhere, there's video everywhere um, and there's sound files and everything. And also there's five stations, one for Sydney, um, Brisbane, Adelaide, um, Melbourne and Perth. Um, and they've all, uh, they're all, all the content served from the same site. And um, yeah, the whole thing's responsive. So a look at the stats um, before we released the site. They had one and a half million uh, unique visitors per month. They had uh, three million three million page views and two and a half minutes was the average time spent on the site. So that jumped up to 32% um, um, more in uh, unique visitors and yeah, 64% increase in page views and the time on site um, almost doubled to four minutes. So I'll be taking you through um, a few things around the uh, responsive design. I'll be uh, focusing on the base theme and um, what we chose and some of the custom stuff that went into that. Um, I'll be uh, going into a lot of detail about res responsive advertising and the media choices as well that we made. So um, getting started, we had uh, a few um, obstacles in picking a theme to choose. So. We had uh, not very much time to, to choose something, or not very much time to implement something. 
Um, we needed something that was going to be reliable and it also needed to be based on 960 grid system, um, which is what Lee's designs um, use. So we could have possibly built a custom theme with a custom grid system and implemented you know, all sorts of different stuff to get that happening. Um, but it kind of made sense to pick a Drupal base theme that was solid and had um, you know, all the work, all the hard work done for us, basically. So uh, we used Amiga um, to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's probably one of the biggest, I think it might even have the biggest user base of Drupal's responsive themes. Um, so that's a pretty big plus going for it. At the time, it was version um, 3.0, I think, so that was another good thing. Um, it's got an awesome grid system, which uses um, collapsing column widths, so it's got um, different grids that you can choose, um, 12, 24 column grids, and the, the grid widths shrink down as the page width collapse, collapses. So, um, and it's also got some other good stuff like JavaScript um, body classes, so the device width adds a body class to the page and can then use that um, to manipulate stuff later on. Um, yeah, so uh, the grid system, you can see um, an example there. I've got the desktop version and then kind of a, the shrunk down version for a tablet. Um, you can see how the various regions in the header um, resize, the navigation's resize, the logo's resize. Um, so there's a little bit of custom stuff that went into that, but the Amiga um, like region uh, grid layout system helped heaps in putting that together. We were literally able to lay out um, the bulk of the site, um, like the base theme of the site, the header and the footer and all that kind of stuff in maybe a day or maybe two days, something like that. Um, yeah, so some other stuff went into um, making uh, the responsive site really stand out. The grid system um, is probably one of the most obvious things. It uses these tiles, which are based on um, the medium rec size. So medium rec is like an advertising format size. It's 300 pixels by 250 um, pixels. Um, so this, these pages that you see here are like listing, standing listing, listing pages. Um, so all the content is arranged in these thumbnails um, and there's actually advertising actually inserted. Um, you can see there at the top and the bottom. So these grids uh, collapse based on the device width. So you've got, um, yeah, three columns for a desktop, two columns for a tablet. And then the mobile version, they kind of shrink down and become much smaller. Um, so, it's, yeah, the, once, it, once it gets down to a mobile um, size, it becomes fluid, yeah, so it stretches out to fill the, fill the page, yeah. Um, uh, we also use CSS media queries to hide certain regions on the page. So we, we had um, the example I've got here, there's a, um, there's two regions at the top. They're mobile only navigation regions. So they're actually in the same HTML that the desktop version gets, but um, they just use a CSS media query to set display none. Um, so they get hidden um, from the user and only displayed um, on the mobile version. So um, it was all this kind of stuff that, that went into it to get um, the responsive site happening. It was the first responsive site I'd actually built at the time, so it was kind of the whole thing was a learning experience, but um, yeah, we got there in the end. Um, yeah, so the next, probably the, probably the hardest thing about implementing the whole uh, responsive side was the advertising. So we have um, tons of different sizes and formats. Um, we've got um, different device widths, and the ads need to be specific for each device. So um, you can see an example here. I've got um, the desktop version in the top. It's got like a full width ad skin kind of thing. Um, then the tablet uh, version on the side there uses leaderboards extensively. Um, mobile version uh, only shows MREX. So each... Each ad, um, each different, you know, device sees different ads, basically. Um, and it's so difficult because you've actually got one 
because the site's responsive, you've only got one version of HTML, so you're not serving different HTML for different devices. And all the ad tags are in the HTML. So, I mean, you could just hide the ad, um, like the particular div that the ad renders. Um, you could just hide that with a media query and say don't show up for mobiles. But um, it will, like the ad engine will still record impressions for that, for that ad. So you have to figure out some way of um, only putting the ad tag in the page for certain, um, for certain devices. And it's all, uh, yeah, it's kind of unnecessarily difficult. I think if the ad um, companies, we were using DoubleClick, if the ad companies were on board with it, it would probably be quite a simple thing to do. Um, there might actually be some, some guys that, out there that do it, but I don't think the major guys like DoubleClick have any real way. You're able to embed like a JPEG version of the ad or something like that, um, but yeah, you can't actually say this ad is only meant to show up on this screen size. So um, JavaScript uh, was the obvious choice there to embed the ad tag. So we wrote a custom um, jQuery plugin, which was about, uh, it, was probably, it was probably only about maybe 40 lines of code or something like that. It was quite, um, quite simple, really. And it took advantage of um, the modernizer media query. So modernizer media query is exactly the same as a CSS media query. It's just in um, JavaScript. So talks to the browser, it gets the device width, and it either returns true or false, um, you know, based on your, your media query. So you can put CSS media queries into, um, into JavaScript and then take advantage of them. So then it was just a matter of writing a couple of lines, um, which uh, took, like, the actual Google ad code and then put that into the page. So instead of embedding the actual ad tag, we just use this little call to the plugin. It just tells the um, tells the jQuery plugin which div to render the ad in, and then you can actually just specify the screen size, um, mobile, tablet, desktop, and then the ad will show for the appropriate size. So um, there were kind of a few limitations in that um, way of working. We still had to use CSS to hide the ad um, block from users in case. You know, you might have a, a user on a desktop which is resizing their browser window or something like that. So if they shrink it down, you want to hide the ad and not break it. But that was a problem then. You wouldn't have ads. You wouldn't have um, ads reloading in that case. So if, if people are shrinking the size down and stuff, the ads might not necessarily appear. But for the bulk of cases, it kind of works pretty well, really. Um, so now on to media. This is just a small splattering of some of the stuff they've got going on. Virtually every article or node um, on the site has some form of image or video or um, gallery or something like that. You can see we've got like um, YouTube, we've got YouTube video players, we've got Brightcove video players, we've got um, view slideshow galleries, um, flow player audio, and um, the biggest difficulty with it all is that the, the actual developers hadn't really implemented very much responsive stuff at all. So even YouTube and things like that aren't really straightforward to, to put into a responsive site, um, which is probably might have come a long way since then. This is kind of the end of 2011 that we were doing this sort of stuff. So it might be a little bit different now. So Flow Player gives us the audio player, which is used for um, podcasts and um, yeah, songs and things like that. It's relatively simple. They've got a kind of a beta um, version plugin. Um, so you just just a matter of embedding that JavaScript, and then you're just able to add iPad to the end, and that gives you a HTML um, audio tag or video tag. So it was relatively simple. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing too tricky there. It doesn't quite work as well as an actual um, embedded audio player, which gives you like a, a play button inside your um, mobile. But yeah, it does seem to work okay. Um, YouTube requires some pretty funky CSS. You have to create a div wrapper, and then yeah, you have to set it as uh, 
position relative. I haven't actually got that in there. But yeah, you set it as position relative and then the iframe, um, Google's iframe gets absolute and then you set its width based on its parent. So it's kind of totally hacky, really, if you look at the code. Um, it's setting weird paddings and stuff like that. There's a few different ways to do this as well. Different people have come up with different stuff and um, if you search the net, you can, you can find all sorts of stuff like that. Um, the iframe, YouTube's iframe embed is actually good because it's got, they've got two versions of the player. They've got a HTML5 player and a Flash player and it'll, it'll show like the HTML5 player for a phone or whatever and um, the Flash player for desktop. So that is something good. Um, and yeah, Brightcove was kind of its own thing. I think, I, I don't really know, um, yeah, if that many people actually use it, but it's, Nova has like tons of their videos on Brightcove and they use it to put ads inside videos and all that kind of stuff. So it was really important for them. But it's, it's kind of nasty because it's putting um, width and height values into um, like deep inside its video tags. So it's not adding it to the object tag, which would be kind of workable. It's adding it to the param um, element, which is a little bit annoying. So you have to actually, uh, that code there is just checking, um, checking the body class. Uh, and then it's adding, um, like it's, it's manually updating the width and the height values. So that works for a mobile and then the tablet version uh, is separate so you have to manually kind of like hard code the width and stuff into your JavaScript which is pretty, um, pretty difficult to work with. But um, the solution actually worked. If you check out Brightcove on the site you can resize it and stuff like that and it does work. Um, yeah, so um, Amiga was great to work with. It was the first um, site I built with Amiga. We've gone on to build heaps more um, after that. Uh, yeah, it was really handy in all the kind of stuff that it's got set up already. It's not really, it doesn't really work the way Drupal works. Like it's kind of a, an anti-Drupal theme in a lot of ways. It kind of implements its own... Um, like pre-processed files and stuff like that and it's got its own way of getting like standard Drupal variables into templates and it's got heaps of extra templates which it just invents and so it's a little bit of a challenge working with it and for newcomers it might be a little like if you're getting into the dirty kind of nitty-gritty of it it's like it's a little bit tricky but it is a great theme and modernizer media queries uh, kick ass I think there might be another JavaScript that does I can't remember um, what it is but they're really handy. They give you CSS media queries in JavaScript, so that's awesome. And um, yeah, like a big slap um, on the <laughs> on the chops for the media guys for not not coming to the party. They could um, it could be it could be a lot better. I mean, things will improve over time. I think responsive sites are com becoming the norm. So yeah. All right, um, I'll pass on to um, my colleague, Mr. Christian Biggins, and he'll take you through content migration. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Christian. I've uh, been with Previous Next for a couple of years. Um, I have uh, a fair bit of background in, in data and migrations in general um, from pre-Drupal days. Uh, so I was brought in to handle the, the content migration for Nova. Got my slides in the wrong order, Jack. <laughs> Anywho, so the considerations um, when when I was brought into this, we had uh, the the existing Nova site um, was a bespoke application. It had no no structured schema at all. Um, it was on a Windows system with a MS SQL database. There was lots and lots of content, like like hundreds of thousands of rows. Um, and there, were, there, was, there was relationships literally between each, each row. Um, everything was connected one way or another. Um, the content and media were stored uh, in different locations. So some, some content uh, was stored in a, in a table specific to that content, um, whereas others were stored in different tables. So for an example of that was that uh, 
a video might be stored in its own video table, um, but it also could be stored in the articles table um, using an embed code. So uh, it made it pretty difficult to make sure that you were pulling videos from the right places. Um, challenges, there was, uh, there was duplicate rows for the multiple sites. Um, Jack touched on how there was, there's localised sites for the station. Uh, there's five that we migrated. Um, each site would have its own content as its own row. So uh, if one article was to be published across the five sites, there would be five versions of that article. Um, because of that, there was lots and lots of, ed lots of edge cases, uh, scenarios where code had been changed and the, the schema had been modified to, to handle a single scenario. Um, also, the, the, not all the content was to be imported because we had uh, they, I mean, we were only handling five of the sites, um, but there were there were many other sites that we weren't actually migrating. They were going to stick with their with their CMS. An example of the relationships that we had. Um, so, if there was an album on the site, uh, the album would have been created by a user. Uh, the album would have uh, tags associated to it. Um, it would have an artist and an image, and these were pretty much uh, the equivalent of having entities. Um, but it would also have lots of manually entered uh, related content. So there would be uh, the manually configured related content block on the side, and everything would have one of those. Um, so we had to make sure that all of these relationships were maintained across the migration. We had lots and lots of potential issues. Um, the, the biggest problem that we we're facing was uh, the chicken and egg scenario, and that is, what do we what do we migrate first? Um, how do we ensure that the user record is there when it's needed to be when we're trying to uh, provide the the author attribute on the album? Um, is there an order that we need to perform them in so that we get that? How do we ensure that we don't get any duplicates? Um, considering there was so many duplicate data already in the in the tables. So our options for handling this was custom code. Um, which was pretty quickly discarded, only we had pretty strong time restraints and, uh, and it was going to be really, really hard to make sure that our relationships were maintained after the migration. Um, the feeds module was another, another option. Um, at the time, there was very little documentation on it and uh, it wasn't going to work very well with the, the unstructured schema that we were facing. So that pretty much left us with the migrate module. So the migrate module gave us lots of uh, things, lots of ways that we could work with what was coming in. Um, the mapping of, uh, of columns and fields was was just so easy, uh, and and it gave us uh, methods for pretty much every stage of the migration, from uh, pulling the query out and altering the data um, to before the entity is saved uh, or after the entity is saved, if you needed that. Um, and stubs, which I'm going to get onto in a minute, uh, which would allow us to create. Uh, entities or placeholders for data that's not yet migrated to uh, assist us in maintaining the relationships. Um, lastly, migrations would occur in batches, so super easy if you if you're doing it through the UI and uh, and and you, you know the connection drops out, you can just take off from where you were. Um, you can use Drush to to kick them off. So the migration mapping is literally that easy. Um, you would have a, a query above, just, just your typical normal SQL query, um, and you would provide the column that you're migrating from and the field name that you're migrating to. Um, there are other uh, options that you can set, such as the um, whether or not it's going to be HTML or plain text or anything. Um, the, bottom, the bottom mapping there uh, sets a source migration, so this is uh, in the case that you might want to create a stub for data that is not yet imported. It's just an example of using the complete method, which is uh, performed after the entity has been created uh, and saved, and you can make any changes to that entity. So uh, in that example, if you wanted to ensure that the user's avatar had been downloaded properly and saved, you could do that, or you could go and get it if you wanted to do it after the migration, because um, the entity is already existing. Prepare method runs after the entity's been created, but before it's been saved. So you can uh, handle any any manipulation you needed to there. Uh, I'm simply adding an, uh, a role to the entity before it's sent off to get saved. And prepare row is is after the row has been pulled out of the database, but before the entity has been created. So this is just another step earlier. 
Um, and here all I'm doing is setting, uh, creating a, a, a URI faux column, if you will, um, for where the, the actual full path of the file. So a little introduction to the stubs, which I mentioned. Um, the scenario we have is if we migrated an album and that album had an author attributed to it with an ID, a legacy ID of 999, um, migrate module knows that that user doesn't actually exist yet. We haven't imported it yet. It will go off and create a stub user. So it will go off and create a, a, an entity that's full of placeholder fields that you, you, you specify, you define those. Um, and then it creates, a, with, the, with the fields that you've specified, it will create a, a, a Drupal user, um, or it could be an entity, it could be a, a node, anything you wanted. Um, so it's created as a Drupal user with a user ID of 100. It will then go and update the album record that we've just imported um, with that user ID, so that we've got that, that relationship maintained. Now what will happen is when the actual user record is migrated through its own migration, um, Migrate will identify that that user has a record already that's been created through a stub, and it will update the stub with the data that you specify in your mapping. So um, in, this, in this scenario, what we've done is created an album uh, without a user record and then updated the user as the information has become available. The stub's really easy to create. You basically have this in your method, uh, in your um, migrate class. So in the user migration class, you would literally have this, this method, um, which just creates a stub with uh, the minimum required fields input. Um, word of warning is that users actually need uh, unique email addresses. So what I'm not showing here is just a function that you have to write to make sure that the email addresses are unique so that it will actually save. After the migration, uh, I've got my introduction slide next, Jack, thanks. <laughs> um, after the migration, we were just running the batch module. Just had a few batches that we uh, set up to make sure that all nodes had the files associated um, and, and were on the file system. Um, we were able to perform a whole bunch of different tests to ensure that uh, the structure was maintained and relationships especially. Um, also able to just make sure that the content uh, could be accessed from the same uh, URI, the same path. So uh, just to ensure that when the site actually went live, the, all, all the URLs remained the same, or at least the redirections worked. And there's my introduction slide. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Nick, who's going to uh, just run through the hosting. Thanks, Christian. Okay, so um, with Nova FM, um, with the consolidation of these five websites, um, coming into the new new Drupal site, um, we wanted to set up a new a new piece of infrastructure that was sort of Drupal centric, um, and it was scalable, easy to use. We could uh, and flexible. Oh, by the way, my name's Nick. <laughs> <laughs> completely skipped to the thing. Um, yep, I'm, I'm a developer at Previous Next. Um, I've been here for about six to nine months now and I've taken over some sysadmin duties too. So now I'll start talking about the host infrastructure. Okay, so the hosting infrastructure that we went through, I'll go through the first and foremost host. That's the load balancer. Um, and it's an F5 firewall load balancer that does round-robin balancing. Um, round-robin balancing is actually pretty simple in concept. Um, as seen in the diagram, five users are hitting the site. Those are what those numbers under the hosts are. Um, user one comes in, hits the first app server, two, three, four, and then five comes back around to the first again, and it'll just keep working its way down. Uh, the next class of app um, the next class is app servers, application servers. Um, these come in two flavors. We have um, active hosts, so those are the ones that are currently running right now. Um, four of we have four of those running in a in a in a cluster setup, um, and we also have inactive 
hot spares on the side ready to be added into the load balancer if needed or powered on and then added into the load balancer. Um, all these hosts come with um, Varnish, Apache, PHP and Memcache. Um, I'll just quickly go through those. Um, Varnish is a, is a caching, caching service that you can put in front of your web host. So it'll cache up the HTML um, files, etc. So it's really snappy every time um, once primed. Um, Apache is your, your um, web server. And um, PHP. Um, and memcached is what we're using to cache all the, um, all the we're using it on our Drupal site, um, the memcached module and passing off um, all the cache data to memcached and stored in memory on the host. Um, all this configuration is Puppet managed. Um, and what Puppet is, is it's a, it's a manifest kept in code and it provides install and update instructions. So if we were to spin up a new host, we can install Puppet, give it a blueprint for what the site's going to be and it'll spin it up and we can start adding more and more if we need to, if there's a, if there's a case for it. Um, if anyone wants to talk about any of these, like Varnished, Puppet, yeah, definitely pop around after and we'll, we'll have a chat. Um, and lastly, the, the code base gets deployed via Drupal Capistrano. Um, and what this means is with one command we can, and git, git control, we can push our code base up to every single app server so everyone gets the same experience across app one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, it also eliminates any, any risk of, um, of things being missed, so very, very handy. Um, these app servers connect to some storage. So in this case, it's, uh, we're using MySQL, a DB, and Solar. Um, these are replicated across two hosts. Um, I actually have a diagram in a future slide where I can sort of show you through, but these operate in a master-slave um, kind of setup. So if one host was to go down, um, the other one can take over and keep going. Um, we also have a, some NAS file storage across all the app servers. Um, this allows for all static assets like images, um, podcasts, I know they have a lot of podcasts up there, um, to be served out across all app servers because if someone uploads an image on the first app server, you want it across two, three, four, and et cetera. Um, it also handles um, for Drupal the settings.php so every app server knows how to connect to the database host. And if you make a change, every host has it mounted up so it's, it's consistent. Um, that is also Puppet managed in the manifest. So we can push that out to all those storage related hosts. Uh, for the website we also use CDN. We use the Drupal module CDN. Um, and what this does is um, we provide a URL of cdn.novafm.com.au. Um, it rewrites it to, in this case, Edgecast. And Edgecast stores the CSS, JavaScript images, and that means, as you can see on this map, they have a lot of um, of stores. And if I were in another country, it'll load nice, fast, snappy. Okay, so um, what we have in front of here is a um, is a diagram of the hosting infrastructure. So at the top, we got our load balancer, uh, F5 load balancer. Below is our app server cluster. Uh, to the right, we have um, our spares. Um, these all undergo the same patching and code updates as their active counterparts. Uh, we also have the NAS on the left, the file storage, which connects to all these hosts, or these hosts connect to it. Um, and then we've got the, the storage for Solar and MySQL. So as you can see, um, Master of Solar doesn't also have Master of MySQL on the same host and they swap. So if one host were to go down, it would move across. Okay, so with all this in mind, um, with Nova FM, there's definitely content that goes viral. Um, 
I think when I came on to Nova FM, Nova FM was already up and they, they were doing competitions and um, I learnt about, they called it the One Direction effect. So, <laughs> and what that was, was, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Um, in this case, we've got um, 17, that's, that's in one hour, that's 17, 18,000 hits. Um, so, and I guess the, what, you ha what has to be considered is um, what type of trap, like what type of page is it that they're hitting, like what, what's going on? Um, and is, is it cached, is it not cached? Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But um, in the case of being cached, that's, that's fine. It's, it's not really that noticeable. If we're not, we're, we're in trouble. So scaling and large traffic. Um, so sometimes content goes viral, one direction, and what are the options? So with all these things in mind, um, we've learnt from our mistakes, maybe when we push up some content that we know may go viral or there's a competition coming that we may know that goes viral, um, we can provision in advance, we can maybe get some hosts into um, the, the, the pool beforehand, get it added into the load balancer so it's less less work at the time and um, less worry. Um, but I guess the thing that we have to consider is at that stage, is it going to be a video where it's cached, the page is cached and it's just going to maybe a YouTube clip or something or in the case of Nova FM, the competitions require a login, the user has to be logged into the site which means that they're not anonymous anymore meaning that, um, that the site's not cached. Um, this means that whoever wins the competition, they know who it is and they're legit across the site. And if this is the case, we definitely have to consider like adding hosts, um, increasing um, resourcing on existing hosts, so beef up what we've already got. And um, sometimes you don't have, get uh, the chance to provision in advance and at a very last call, write it, write it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next we have our geolocation. So um, as my my colleagues have said, we had five websites. So the case was, yep, Nova FM has five websites: Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, Sydney. And um, they were all coming into the one Drupal site, and we had to ensure that. Um, that user base were actually getting directed to the correct content. So if I was in Brisbane, I, I want to see Brisbane content. I don't want to um, see that a station's on right now or a program's on right now and flick to the radio and it's not because um, that's that's just annoying. Um, so, yeah, we need to make it as easy as possible. So enter um, Apache Mod Geo IP2. Um, so a quick quick little overview is uh, GOIP offer a city and a light version. Um, in this case, we went with the light version as um, city provides is a paid service and um, it gives you a database that you can, you can update and, or it's more frequently updated because it's very granular. Um, in this case, the major cities aren't going anywhere. Um, but if someone in their app were to purchase the paid version, they would do it because they want to know street numbers and street addresses and that, that kind of granularity, that really low granularity. So we went with a, a static, the static copy of the free GOIP light database. So the benefits of that were um, the configuration was within the Apache vhost com, um, configuration, so we didn't have to bootstrap Drupal. So um, if we were to put this kind of logic in uh, Drupal, we would be bootstrapping Drupal, um, like firing up the site, uh, checking where they were, and then redirecting to the appropriate URL for the station. So that's two bootstraps for the same, same thing that we can do right there in Apache. And um, yeah, that, the redirect is, is cached too. Okay. 
So with all this in mind, um, after it was all implemented, we ran into a few issues. Um, so each each station gets a gets a header set for it. So once they're redirected to their, so if I was redirected to Brisbane, I would get a header of that station. That means that when I go to a competitions page, all the all the content or all the related content um, is Brisbane esque. Brisbane related. Um, I'm not seeing anything Sydney related. I'm not sort of getting pushed to other stations content. Um, and the issue that we ran into from doing this is Drupal caches its page and uses the URL as the key. So in this case you can see um, competitions it would have the page cached with the key as competitions. Um, but we don't want that because if I'm in, if I'm in Brisbane and someone's already primed the cache and created that cache in Sydney, I'll be seeing Sydney content. So how do we get around this? Um, varnish. So we use Varnish to um, interpret the header. And as you can see in this diagram, I'm I see slash competitions. Varnish rewrites the URL to add this uh, Nova FM station key on the end. And that's what Drupal, that's what Drupal caches. And I don't see that, that's, that's deeper, that's deeper level stuff. I don't see that in the browser, I never, never see that. And what we now have is if all the, all the stations are, if five people from different areas are viewing that one competitions page, that's five, five versions of the page being cached now by Drupal. Um, and before this, um, myself and Mig had a bit of a chat, um, and how, co how could this be improved? How, how could we improve what we have already? Um, Drupal's setting the header, um, Apache's doing the rewrite, Varnish is doing um, this, this really nice rewrite of the URL that, that the end user doesn't know about. Um, and it turns out that um, Varnish now, in version 3, there's a vmod for GOIP. And um, what this would mean is we could um, we could set the cookie all in Varnish, and we could um, we could set that URL in Varnish, and we could do the redirects. Um, this would simplify the approach down. Um, this would mean that yeah, we don't have like Apache doing a little bit, Drupal doing a little bit, and and Varnish doing a little bit. Bring it in, and it means that we're not locked into Apache no more. We're, we could go Nginx or something along those lines moving forward. Ad adds, adds more flexibility. So, um, in conclusion, um, we now, moving forward, have, a, have an environment with more options of scale. And um, with, with everything going on, we now, we now know that we need, we need some, um, some forewarning if content's going to go viral. That's definitely a lesson that we've learned moving forward, and I believe the relationship between us and the client, like the client knows when something's going to go viral and the conversation starts most of the time. <laughs> Some, sometimes you just don't know. And um, the last one is, yeah, GOIP is a great solution. There's definitely many ways to implement it, so across Apache or Varnish. So. Cool. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Yeah, come, so. come on, come on, Go for it. Mossy. Um, so the question was, could we use the user agent to sniff out um, the browser? Yeah, instead of a mini query. Um, yeah, I guess the problem with that approach is you're not so much sniffing out um, devices um, or browsers. You, you actually need the device width. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can actually get that in the user agent or not. You can. Yeah. Yeah, that could work too. Yeah, yeah. There'd, there'd be tons of different ways of doing it. Um, 
there, there wasn't too there wasn't too much additional JavaScript in the page. There was kind of like for each ad tag, there was just that one line that you saw. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that adds the ad tag in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I basically just chose that way because it seemed like the simplest way for me to be able to implement it. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, the question was the CSS. Did we use a CSS preprocessor? Yeah, we used uh, SAS. Um, yeah. So uh, to add to that, how did we compile SAS and integrate it with Amiga? Um, Amiga's got a, a bunch of different CSS files that it spits out for um, layout. It's got different uh, different CSS files for each layout version. So we literally just had a SAS file in our theme, a SAS uh, folder um, in our theme, and it had like, SAS versions of all the Amiga style sheets. And then we just ran the compiler locally um, and then check the compiled CSS into into GitHub. Yeah. Um, yeah. We d <sighs> is that is that a Drupal module? Yeah. There's also Sassy or Susie or something like. No, I think it's called Sassy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We didn't use Compass. We kind of had our own library of mix-ins and things like that. We had a variables file and like a, a base partials file with mix-ins and stuff like that. But we, we didn't really, this, this was kind of back in 2011. I've only really start, started using Compass recently. So yeah, it was probably a bit before that time. Yeah. At the back. Oh, okay. So, um, so the question was, how do you manage content across all, for example, all four app servers? Um, so the database is external to the app servers. So all all four hosts are connecting to that database for that for that record. Um, and in terms of files, um, because that's mounted up on storage, each host has its files directory mounted up in storage. Um, the files available on on all four. Um, yeah. Yeah, yep, so so you're Oh, okay, no. Um so the question was um when content when creating content is there some kind of automation to Yep. Yep, yep. Yep. So Oh, can they do that? So Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. So, do Nova FM have the have the means to spin up extra extra app servers, yeah, like automatically. or aut automatically? Um, no, that's that's all. Um, we have a pretty pretty tight relationship between Nova FM and the and the hosting provider. So, it's um it's really all um, discussions between between the three of us.
Sorry. Oh, so, sorry. Do you, yeah. 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 Um, at at the time, no. Um, it's it's a methodology that we've recently started kicking on, and it's definitely something that ha, ha, is that something that you've you've taken on continuous integration because I'd love to talk with people and see what they they do to solve it. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to I'd love to chat afterwards. That's that's for sure because it's definitely top of mind. It has been for the past. Few. Uh, not not on this project, no, not not at that stage. At the back. Um, what methods did you use to classify the content across the five different stages? Like, was it just a taxonomy term or was it something more like the main actor? Yeah. Same um, so the question was, how do we classify content uh, to stations? Yeah, it was it was all taxonomy based. There was just one taxonomy with five terms and. Um, when content editors are creating content, they can just choose one or more of the stations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the for all those uh, terms that don't have any terms, are there or are they just all um, Yep. Yeah. They're they're all v VPSs hosted by another another company. So the question was why I didn't import the user first. Um, the user was the easiest way for me to, to explain how stubs worked. Um, the, the relationships went across everything. So uh, an album would have an artist record and that artist record also has a user. <laughs> that artist record also has tags, etc. And this was across every, every piece of content, articles, artists, albums, um, videos, songs, audio, you name it. So, there was there was no starting point, you know. There was nowhere where you could start. Yeah, users was probably the only thing we could have imported uh, on its own initially. Um, but everything else, there was just far too many connections involved. I'm not sure. I actually wasn't across the project at that stage. I was post um, MIG. Yeah. Yep, absolutely MIG. Um, nothing, nothing's, there's no, sorry, the question was, um, does the scaling of the host reflect nodes or, or users? Um, um, no, no, it doesn't. Um, it's more of a, it's um, very static, but it's sort of monitoring um, performance and, and um, how much resources are taken at, over a period of time. Yep. And should we upgrade moving forward? The question, the question was, was um, automation considered in the, in the beginning of the project? Um, consideration is that there was no at least major Australian based cloud providers yeah, 
towards the end of 2011, so there was, there was simply no option for an automated system at all. What was the mechanism of the emergency Yeah, well, there's lots of options now, absolutely. If you were to do it now, there would be a lot more things oh, to consider. No. Oh. <laughs> hey, hey, I thought I... Um, so the question was, well, how did we clean the data? The, uh, we tried lots and lots of ways to try to automate the data cleaning um, at the end, in the end, because some, some content was uh, plain text and, and, like I said, lots of things were embedded files. Um, in the end, it was just it, it, all, all tags were stripped out. Um, there was lots of JavaScript embedded in a lot of the content, so it was literally uh, as if someone had saved the page as it sat and then whacked it in the database, so there was lots of importing of scripts. Um, there, was, there was no way to safely ensure that what we would end up with was, was valid, safe HTML. So we, there was lots of things that we were able to keep, um, you know, strong tags and things like that, but the majority of tags were just stripped out um, on the way through. Um, so the question is, uh, how do we test the migration? Um, we sampled, we just grabbed samples of certain, um, certain content of, of each different type and then uh, matched it against the database that we imported from the legacy system. Um, so there was no, uh, we, weren't, we weren't comparing with a live site, we were comparing with the database and then writing queries to match as, as well as we could. Um, there were, there, the, the cleaning scripts and the, and the testing scripts were rewritten dozens and dozens of times because we would get 90% through and there'd be one simple, one single case where it wasn't the same and so that would have to be included. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's where I sing the praise of the batch module. It just makes that stuff very easy. Uh, it's all accessible. It's all accessible through Solar. So Solar does all the indexing for us. Um, as far as I know, nothing was actually archived from what we brought over from the previous system. So uh, it's, it's, it will be, it, it's, it's massive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of nodes. We did, we did lots of that. Um, towards the end, we had our whole team that would just be clicking through randomly just following links and, and just site checking samples of code. There's, there's no way. We found issues with missing files and that came down to some files being available some places and not others. So there were a lot of clean up scripts that we wrote afterwards to re-download files that were missing. Yep. Yeah, pulling out the source, downloading the file to the file system um, and, then, and then importing it as a media object, uh, media entity. It, it, would, it would take a while, um, I think, to pull it out so that, it's, so that it's generic enough to be used. Um, we definitely considered doing that. Uh, it was very specialised what, what we were doing. It was very, very specific to our needs at the time. Um, I, I don't know many use cases where, where what I wrote would be useful. Sorry? Yeah. No, that's right. So in those, I uh, showed the, the complete and the prepare methods. So in, in both of those, in the prepare you can clean it and in the complete you can confirm that it, was, that it worked. So the entity, saved entity matches the row without I anything additional. Thanks, everyone.